I had an experience in Europe at our European summit. We focused this year on multi-generational partnership. And one of our team members there said, we talk a lot about transitions from one generation to the other, which is needed because there, there needs to be, um, we try to be seamless, but there does need to be a transference of leadership in a local church or ministry. And yet what he was promo- what he was telling us to look at is an is, is a ongoing generational partnership between multiple generations at one time. Of course, God is a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so we see this in Scripture. So that's what got me thinking about this topic. And um, all I want to do is get you thinking. It's not going to be as profound uh, and as much content, but I want you to think about something in your own churches and ministries. I'm, I'm thrilled to see the number of uh, Gen X and Gen Z leaders here today. And in general, HarvestNet churches probably do pretty good in bringing the young people, younger generations into leadership, but that's really my topic for the day. Um, I see it as an important stewardship when you have a church with a lot of younger leaders that have potential. And of course, we want to multiply churches and ministries, so we need to find a way to engage the younger generations in ministry and maybe give them on-ramps and um, some opportunities. Uh, So I'm going to make a case for multi-generational leadership, and then uh, we have a panel of some Gen X, maybe even one or two Gen Zs. I forgot uh, their ages, but they're going to, I want you to hear from them. And Matt Gwynn's going to lead that as soon as I'm finished. So uh, when, you know, when I started ECC, when we started ECC, we were in a time of uh, what they call the generation gap. Now, some of the old guys here and women will remember this, but there was tension between the young and the old back in the 60s and 70s, and it showed up in everything. It was just sort of culture-wide. How many of you saw the movie Jesus Revolution? Oh, wow, a bunch of you. Uh, That was us, not to the extent that they had in California, but we lived through that, and for us it wasn't thousands, but it was um, a youth meeting in in the Stonehouse basement where I live now. That went up to about 60 or 70 people, and they were all young people from Catholic, um, well, just almost any kind of denomination, Methodism, Lutherism, some Mennonites, and they were getting saved, and they, some of them really didn't have a lot of church background or connection to a local church, and they were finding it hard to integrate. And there were some, of course, that were, that were involved that were just filled with the Spirit. Um, so, but I, I try, I try to have some of my friends integrate into, into the local church and I, I was having difficulty because some of the, I was in the Mennonite church, good, 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 uh, heritage, which I appreciate, but they were finding it hard to become Mennonite, you could say, with all the, the things that come with that. So the head bishop of the Lancaster Conference of Mennonite Church, Dave Thomas, great man, Him and Paul Landis, who was a head of missions and church planting at the time, come to us and said, why don't you start a uh, a charismatic Mennonite church? So we had six meetings. It was all set up. When it came down to the local level, we ran into some difficulties. And as I look back, I think I should have had more process. But what we did is we just decided to quietly leave and start a house church because uh, we didn't want to split the church. We didn't want to pull people out of the church. But at that time, there was tension between younger people and our dreams and visions and the, and the older. And as much of it was our fault as it is the older people. But we were a little, not just a little arrogant, a little rebellious and very arrogant because we had a different idea that we thought we could show everybody how to do church a different way. Um, so we, we left quietly and started a house church in, uh, with a number, actually there's probably a couple in the room here, Mark's here, somewhere it was here, and we started in our mobile home. But amidst the, the turmoil, the tension and the polarization between young and old, um, and then my experience in having to leave the church to start something that young people uh, would come to, I sort of made a vow to God, 
And Sue, this probably wasn't in her vow. Maybe I need to talk to you about this. But I sort of promised God I wanted to build a church that young people did not have to leave to follow their dream. And so I, I purposefully, because I didn't want that to happen uh, to anybody else. I mean, obviously, we send people out. We release people. That's normal. That happens all the time. But I didn't want a situation where people just felt like the church was not responsive to their generation and had to leave. Uh, I didn't want that. And, um, you know, I'd served in the church, started as a junior usher at nine, and then was did a you know, boys' ministry to boys when I was in my teenage years. And by 17, I was on the church council. So I was very invested in the local church. I was not anti-local church, but I, I, they didn't understand what we wanted to do. There was just a breakdown in understanding, and it was uh, the hippies with their long hair and bare feet didn't fit well. So we started the church, and uh, I, I wanted, I remember saying that we want gray hair and youth on every team. So I wanted to have it both generations together on everything. It was sort of a rule, uh, a little hard to do. And I remember saying with music and stuff, and, I, and uh, I'm, I'm old now, but even back then, having the volume louder than what most churches had was sort of revolutionary, believe it or not. And I would tell, tell the old people, we're going to lean that direction in our kind of music with the kind of instruments we had. I mean, the first a, a drum kit in the church was a big deal. And um, I, remember t I remember putting a box of earplugs in the back saying, help yourself, which was not appreciated. And I said, we're going to keep the volume louder. It was still in OSHA regulation range, but it's going to be louder than what the church would be. And we were going to lean the direction of the culture of youth and keep it that way. And the older people who are supposed to be more mature are sub just need to adjust. And this happens with every generation. So I didn't make everybody happy with that. One guy gave us a quarter of a million dollars for a building but then, com then complained about the volume, and I thought, wow, can I really, maybe I should get responsive here. But I said, you know, we're going we're gonna to leave the volume within OSHA range, but there are earplugs. Because he was, you know, he, he, had, he didn't like the, it, it bothered his ears, and I said, earplugs would help you do that. It frightened me, but he ended up being sort of a champion for younger generation and for technology and gave a lot of churches, a number of churches, money to buy that kind of stuff right there. And he was, he was fairly aged. So um, that's just sort of the, the, sort of the tension that we started in. But I, I feel like we want young people to be able to follow God. And so we have our vision, we have our system, we have our organizations and our uh, corporations and everything. But God has always given younger people a vision and a dream and somehow or other, we have to be able to understand that and connect with it rather than forcing them to do something else. Um, because it is their church. And I, I wanted something that was integrated. Uh, I wanted to keep everything from younger, you know, children and youth and adults connected together. And we still have, you can still have specialized ministry, but that was sort of the vision. And I didn't want to suppress uh, younger people that where they feel like they have to just serve and wait, pay their dues, and eventually maybe someday they can actually get involved in leadership. Um, I've, I've seen old men hold to their power and crush young leaders, drive young people out of a church, not, not intentionally, but simply because they were unwilling to, to, to pull them in or to understand them. They, the culture of the church, the pattern, the traditions always stayed the same, and it just eventually wasn't that of the younger generation. But the, the church should be theirs, and of course the future will be theirs. They're going to be leading us at some point, and so I, we needed to, um, to make adjustments for that. And we made a lot of mistakes through the years, uh, growing the church. But even today, there's still a fairly young demographic. How, what is the average, do you know what the mean age is, 20? 26 is the mean age, and what, seven to 800 children and youth? On the weekends, yeah. 
So, and I know many of the churches here have the same demographic, but I fear um, some generational tensions could ignite again. And so today I'm appealing for understanding and intentionality for transition as seamlessly as possible between generations. And I'll, and I'll, I'll get authority from Pew Research Center who says, if ever there was a moment to gird for a generational war, now would seem to be it. So these are people that study these things. They're saying what they see. And um, I think we need to understand each generation's story to connect to them better, understand what they grew up with, what they're thinking, and it is different. And the pace of change and the, the distance between the generations is increasing a little bit because of the culture. And one, one writer said that we must, those that are in office in leadership uh, positions must read them before we lead them. As if we, if we try to lead as if they're our age, we will make mistakes. So I want, I want to begin by reading, listen to what this one guy said about the younger generation. He said, children now love luxury, they have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for elders, they love to chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, they chatter before company, they gobble up dainties at the table, cross their legs and tyrannize their teachers. So what generation do you think wrote that? What's that? You're right. Wow, give that guy a prize. So it, it sounds like something uh, a generation, uh, you would say about the generation, a couple of generations younger than you. But this was written by Socrates uh, 2,400 years ago. And, uh, you know, the whole thing of generational change and tensions and transition is not new. It's been there all the time. And it's just common because we grew up with a set of values and think and thoughts and patterns. And um, we just need to adjust. We need to change. I believe God's heart for gen multi-generational partnership has existed. Uh, we can see it in scriptures, like I said, with God being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when it goes wrong, God does intervene redemptively. And, um, but he prophesies to work in this way before the day of the Lord. And I don't know when the day of the Lord is, but we're closer now than we were yesterday, for sure. Malachi 4 says, Behold, I'm coming to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming day, the, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and strike the land with complete destruction or with a curse. So that can be applied to a family setting. I would like to apply it also to the church world, whether it's in a local church, whether it's in a network of churches and Christianity in general. I believe that the spirit of Elijah, the prophetic movement that we're in now, which is probably uh, the most understanding of prophetic ministry that we've had broadly um, in terms of seeing and hearing and repeating God and visions and all sensing things. Um, I believe that, that the prophetic movement can heal separations that men create. So what I see globally, I see some churches that have lost all their young people. And I, honestly, I think the older generation has to take at least some of the blame for that. That's a harsh thing to say. But also I see it in this area. I mean, I have relatives that attended a church uh, where there are no young couples and no young people. It's just older people. And the problem with that is to try to attract young people or younger couples or singles or youth when you have none is very hard and requires miraculous intervention of some way. So it's worth stewarding um, the generations to not get to that point. You know, many churches have older leaders, but fewer younger leaders. I sit with elders teams. The most fun I had was in Kiev where every elder on the leadership team was under 30. You could barely use the term elder, I think, pro properly. But it was the most fun leadership team I've ever sat with around a table. They were all professionals, all educated, very sharp, 
And uh, we started a church with 10 of them, and they grew to 70 before the war started. Um, but when there's very little opportunity, and I, I agree with Dan, I'm not, I'm not really into the congregational kind of government, but there has to be opportunities for a younger generation to find their way into leadership uh, or into ministry um, without just being told to serve, sit, listen, pay your dues, and wait. Often church, churches maintain their culture to match that of the aging leader. And uh, it's funny because I've, I've been in churches where, I mean, I could tell by the song, the song dated when they, st the songs dated when they started because of the style and the song choice. And they had not kept up with the newer songs. They didn't like the new songs. They criticized them all, which I get. Uh, you can be a critique of songs. But it, it was not, it did not feel very good to the younger generation and they didn't stick around. And I watched as I returned sometimes that they're not there. The ones I saw, I remember... I remember in one church seeing a group sitting in the back row, and I told Cheryl when I left, I bet you next year they won't even be here. And it's sad when, when that happens. I believe we constantly must identify new leaders from the younger generation and help them into leadership. And sometimes, you remember when, we, when, when God uh, selected David among all his brothers, it was not always the head and shoulders above everybody else, but it was someone with a heart after God. So we have to look for more than skills, education, brilliance. I love all that stuff. But sometimes, the Davids will rarely put themselves forward. You know what I mean? We have to find them, and we have to call them up. Uh, when I go to pastor's meetings, and as there's no young pastors there, it concerns me. Because I, 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 you know, whether it was good or not, I started pastoring when I was 20. We had the group forming while I was 19. And we went on a wedding trip and then turned 20 on the trip. And then two weeks after we came back, we started. So if you, and Steve was telling me of a, of a survey, a statistic done of some of the leaders that have been in ministry for long, long times, like three, four decades, five decades. It's embarrassing, isn't it? A lot of them started when they were in their teens or early 20s. Is that right? What was the common age you remember? Early 20s, something like that. So there are, there are leaders, maybe don't know everything, maybe can't do everything perfectly, but God calls them young, and when they start young, they stay with it, and they're still serving in their 60s and 70s. So to say that you have to be older to be in the government part, I think is just uh, short-sighted. So at the European Summit this year, we, we focused on intergenerational leadership, multi-generational leadership, and we invited two speakers to come. Uh, they were not actually from H&I churches, but they came via Svof, uh, in Poland, we recruited them and brought and they addressed us. And, um, you know, the content of what they said was not university level, but the heart impact, uh, it impacted everybody. In fact, I don't know if there was a dry eye in the room. And I think we realized that we needed to um, br bring them into things. And so the European team agreed to take some steps. Um, I, we, we, I, I did a, a trial run here in the U.S. I think I had 15 or 16 in our house, Cheryl and I. Uh, some of them are here today. But we, I just want, I said, I'm going to let Matt ask questions, and I'm going to just take notes. And that's what I did because I felt like I needed to listen. Uh, it's, it was easy for me to assume, yeah, I understand them, and, 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 and I get them, and I see the faults, and I see the, thing, the, you know, the good things and all that. I understand them. But I felt like that's risky because you, I don't think we do until we listen and, and let them be honest. So I said, what you say will not be quoted outside this room. You can be completely honest about how you feel, and I really do want to know. And, and they, were, they were very helpful. So we have one coming up in Warsaw in December with uh, 26 Gen Z and Gen X from 10 different nations. And uh, I'm looking forward to it, and they're very excited. They're already asking for other uh, next generation events in Europe, and we're talking about a, a young adult camp in Croatia on the coast in the summer. We'll, we'll have to run that by them. I want them to buy in or th suggest what they want. But it's easy for existing leaders to make everything about we can make everything about ourselves and not be intentional about welcoming, including, and transitioning. 
So in other words, let's not wait until we have to call the next pastor to actually bring the next generation on board. And I believe one step we can take is to listen and to seek to understand. I think I read something like that in the Bible, right? To, to seek to understand first and then speak or speak less. So there's a chart here. The, and the goals in these things, uh, can you show the chart? I'm, you, I don't, you're not probably going to be able to read that. Can you read it anywhere? Up to the middle anyway. It's out, it's out of the book. I'm not, I'm not going eat, to eat even cover it all. But the, the goal should not be to pigeonhole because there are generalizations and there are exceptions. And I know that, you know, if you read it, you're going to say, well, that's not true. Well, um, it maybe isn't for most of the younger people that you know, but this, is, these, this comes from a sociologist. And so I'm looking at this, trying to understand the, the, the generations. Every generation has thing, have things that is unique to their when they grew up. And so that shapes them. And um, this just goes over their life model, motto, their values, work ethic, technology, a view of authority, their communication, and the percentage of the workforce, which is interesting. We'll talk about that later. Um, I wanted to have, I was thinking about having copies to give you. I apologize, but I'm not going to take the time to go through it. I think we need to get to the panel. The, the ones I focus on are Gen Y and Z, Millennials and Gen Z. Millennials, um, they grew up you know, from 1983 to 2000 during campaigns focusing on child safety, self-esteem, and um, status became factors on how parents raised their kids. Um, as children became a top priority, millennials grew into the largest generation in U.S. history, about 80 million. Um, millennials were the first generation that didn't need adults to get information. And I think about that one because they, everything was available on their fingertips. When I was teaching in HSM classes, I, have, I don't know if, uh, yeah, there she is. She was my fact checker. I was doing church history. And I had the dates in my notes wrong, and it wasn't more than about 20 seconds, and she would raise her hand and say the date is actually this. But which is good. I didn't mind that at all. I mean, I didn't take offense. I had my notes wrong. But it's, it's all there for them instantly, anytime. They grew up in a health economy, and uh, most entered adulthood feeling very confident. They grew up in a protective culture as parents became obsessed with safety. They grew up in an affirming culture as adults chose to build high self-esteem. They grew up in a collaborative and pressurized culture that cultivated stress. Uh, so these are some of the things that they, that they deal, deal with. They grew up with options. So many bring a free agent uh, mentality to life and to work, which I wasn't there with, uh, you know, with baby boomers, and it could be good and bad. Gen Z, 2001 to 2015... These dates are also, um, I've seen different sets of dates, so it's all sort of subjective. And some people that are born like before or after the line identified with a different generation. So these are big generalizations, not true all the time. But in their generation, society pivoted again with the dot-com bubble burst and the troubled economy and the corporate scandals and the 9-11 attack. They grew up in an era of terrorism Racial unrest and mass shootings. Uh, smart technology began to connect us, but also disconnect us. Technology began to foster mental health issues. And uh, sometimes they're called the coronals because they are now marked by the pandemic that we all lived through. Gen Z not only has new language, but uses it on platforms that their parents, many of them still don't even know exist. You think about that. And... Um, I didn't know this, but they tell me that many Gen Zs have five or six online identities for different purposes. Again, these are things I didn't know. Each new generation, um, time becomes more valuable, and the demand for work to have meaning intensifies. So it's not just for them about paying bills, but it, it, they want it to have meaning, which I think is fantastic. Um, and with each new generation, the hunger for options grows, and the sense of entitlement also increases because of the way society is going. 
what they tell me, and I'm quoting sociologists and authors here, but collectively they'll say that many young professionals feel their managers don't understand them or value their input. So they will comply, they will serve because they want to need a paycheck, but they don't feel, um, and this, this may not be true in this room, but uh, this is wider culture. Um, so while the comment, com their comments are offered with respect, the young leaders felt a gap between them and their older managers and felt like the older generations were out of touch with them. So this is my appeal. I'm 66, and I would have some conversations with our staff, and uh, Gloria taught me some slang. I don't know if Gloria, uh, back there she is. I'd, I'd never heard these things. And uh, so I went to Maddie when I was planning an event for um, our school reunion and talk to her about how the generation communicates. And I learned stuff about how it works that I would have never guessed because my, my, my generation uh, operates very differently. So let me give you a list and then I'm gonna let the panel come. This, this is what I believe is required for deeper connection with those of a different generation. So this would apply to both the young and the old and we have both represented here. Uh, the first one is to break out of our generational ghettos. We tend to live and it's natural. We, we go out to eat with people our age. We hang out with people our age. But try to find a way to break out of that a little bit. Build relationships with other generations. To the older, to the older guys here, when was the last time you did something new for the first time? Tried something new because we tend to find what works for us and we stick to that. I was in Albania sitting across from a young man who just finished his master's degree in artificial intelligence and was asked to be the lecturer at the University of Tirana. So we got to talk at any rate. I put it on my phone, which I later took off because he said, no, you don't want it on your phone. But, he, but we start talking about artificial intelligence and how it could be used for good. I had no idea, really, honestly, what it was, how to use it. I know all I hear on the news is the scary stuff about controlling it or shutting it down, which is probably there. But th that was actually sort of fun for me to have a young person lead me in learning something new. You can do this. Number two, humility. When we approach a different generation with humility, it communicates openness to input and a recognition, a recognition that we're all human and flawed. And uh, sometimes the generation, and I probably do this as well, my staff could tell me this, but we, we come across as if we already know, and they need to just sort of listen to us. So it requires humility, and that would go both directions. Number three is listening. Listening screams humility when we can keep our mouth shut and listen. Uh, I'm a high eye person. I talk too much. I overplay my personality. I know that, but I have to I have to learn to listen to the other generations. And um, older leaders, are you open to new ideas when they're from a less experienced source? Because we feel like we've done something, we, we should, we're authorities in it now. But suppose there's an idea that we never thought of, it doesn't fit our paradigm. I'm not saying you should go with it, I'm just saying we need to have an openness to that and that if there's, a, if there's dialogue and a sharing in the generations, it'll be really helpful. Number four is respect. We live in a very uncivil and disrespectful era, have you noticed? I, I mean, that's why I got off of Facebook. I'm not saying you need to, but I just got tired of the BS that was on there and the angry um, stuff that I was hearing. Everybody, we live in a disrespectful society, yet everybody is demanding to be respected. How is that going to work? But respect communicates that you esteem the other person or that you esteem the other generation. You may still disagree, but you can listen respectfully. Number five is curiosity. Curiosity, curiosity trumps conflict, and it builds a bridge where there may not have been, where there may have been a wall. So it, go, it goes back to Dan's, um, help me understand. Is that what it was? What he called it? Those kind of conversations. Just help me understand it and just start there. Number six is honor. And I think honor has to go both ways. I think that the old have to honor the young. We are supposed to be the mature ones, right? And uh, instead of always just demanding that the younger generation honor us. 
Number seven, intentional commitment to the church as family. Um, I know the church is an organization. I know that there's corporateness and structure necessary. At the same time, I still, pardon me, but I still like to see the church the way God sees it. And if you look all over scriptures, there's a lot of metaphors, but the biggest metaphor from Old Testament through the New is that the church is the family of God. And that has to be, has to be priority in the way we build culture and the way we see people. Paul's, Paul's coaching Timothy, a younger leader, and all his terminology is, is family terminology. Treat the older men as fathers, the younger guys as brothers, the older women as mothers, the younger girls or women as uh, sisters. And uh, that was his advice on how to lead and pastor the church he was in. Um, so I, don't, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not knocking the corporate mentality or organization because I know it's necessary. But just don't forget that it's family. Gen Z and Gen X want authentic relationship and they want community. I see them nodding their heads while I'm talking. If they don't find community in our structures and organizations and corporations, they will find it somewhere else. So just, just a fair warning. Um, we, we, they, they, we need to even... We need to find ways for large churches to still have a small feel and for people to have community there. Number eight is older generations could try reverse mentoring. I read this in a book and I thought, really, I really need to try this. So I called Matt. Maddie, came to the office, and I started asking her questions. And then this guy with AI, I've done the same thing with Michelle and Glory a little bit and just asking their opinions. And I, I actually enjoyed the learning that, uh, and Matt also, I just saw Matt here, Matt's also been helpful. Uh, he's a little bit older than Gen X, but still in, in the younger generation for me. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I like learning, and so I found, wow, I'm 66, and I just discovered I can learn from young people. Uh, so get some advisors. But then the flip side is interesting, too. I'm not going to say a lot about this, but younger leaders, once you're in power, you, you, um, you need to realize that while other older leaders might be out of touch, um, don't make the mistake of King Rehoboam, where he would only listen to the youngers. I'm going to read this as 1 Kings 12, 8. But he ignored the advice of the elders which, he, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and who served him. So he didn't, he, apparently he, he was a young leader given the kingship, but there were older, older leaders that, that, were sort of, that he sort of inherited. But instead of listening to the older generation, he listened to those that worked for him or those that were his age that he grew up with. So I'm not saying that there's, we, we need to have it both ways. We need to listen to the younger and the older. But for, for younger leaders, it would be easy to conclude the old guys are out of touch, and probably we are. But we learned a lot of things by making mistakes. The older leaders could probably help you not make mistakes. Or when you're in the middle of a battle, we might say, yeah, I remember that. I know what it felt like, and uh, we, there's still some value there. When we started the church, we had three co-equal leaders. Um, and we only consulted people our age. And that was a mistake. One of the biggest things that I had across with the elders is when I said, I, they, they wanted, we were co-equal, they wanted me to take the, the role of senior pastor. And what I told the other guys is that I will do it under one condition. You allow me to get a mentor from outside the church that's older and has experience to speak into us. And that was a several month discussion because they were, they were afraid that our vision, our dream, would be destroyed by an older person. But it was one of, it was one of the best things that I did. There was, it was funny because there was another group later on, like a generation later, that were all in their 20s, and they were all into spiritual fathering, but it was 25-year-olds fathering 24-year-olds. So maybe they're more mature, they probably were. I'm not saying there's no val any value in that, but it was sort of funny for me, the old guy, to, to see this. Uh, it didn't go well because there, weren't, there wasn't anything, uh, any younger, le older leaders. You know the story of the elephants in Palanisburg, South Africa. They put a, a new herd of younger elephants in the park, 
and they they got rowdy and rammy and uh, the park rangers tried a number of things to change it uh, but what eventually somebody said just get an old elephant and put them in with the younger elephants then the old so they got an old bull elephant who was probably too old to move very much but they put him in the midst of the younger and it, it just all it all calmed and evened out so I think there needs to be the, the older people um, we, we need the younger and you know eventually they're going to lead us did I skip over the Okay, that's only coming up. Yeah, all right, here we go. Yeah, all right. So, so there, there, there needs to be a partnership between the two. I'm, just for time, I'm going to skip right to the workplace. Do you know that millennials and Gen Z already make up two-thirds of the U.S. workforce? It's making me feel really old right now. Within two years... They will fill 70% of the jobs in the U.S. workforce. Soon they will lead us. And we need, we need to understand that, that, that the time is here. If you're, in your, if you're in your 50s or 60s or 70s, the time is here. Um, we need to get to know them, appreciate them. We need to give them opportunities. Instead of waiting until we're, we're ready to give up the salary and then throwing them the church, um, we need to give them an experience right now. So there's the chart. Yeah, that was surprising to me. Uh, just very quickly, some qualities and contributions of each generation. Baby boomers, life experience, awareness of pitfalls, life coaching for younger generations. That's sort of our role right now. Baby busters, which is Gen X, because of the... the um, the boom ended at that point. Uh, they're realistic in their perspective and pragmatic in wisdom, resourcefulness, and balance. Millennials bring energy and confidence and tech savviness and optimism and social connections are sort of strong suits for them. And then Gen Zs are entrepreneurial. They have a hacker mindset. Um, <laughs> just yesterday, I was trying to help our new bookkeeper understand something and in, in, uh, do something with uh, online transfers. And Michelle's sitting there in the room listening, and she said, do you need help? And I said, please. And she came and, what, in like 15 seconds, solved it for us. She hacked the, the problem, and she got it done. Um, a primary pitfall for all generations is to ignore and dishonor the others. It's just very common. So my plea, my plea is, let's let the spirit of Elijah turn our hearts toward each other. I think there's a massive move come, and we can't afford to be in the midst of this stuff when that happens. We need to prepare, and I feel urgency to train, to engage and train and release younger leaders across the globe, and uh, we're, we're talking, to, I, I didn't get to India yet, although India has, does a decent job of that. The cultural aspects are different. Um, I don't want to get into all that. But let's choose to be intentional, build partnerships across generations. We have a lot of young leaders in H&I churches, and let's steward it as an amazing gift from God. It's a generation that is eager and zealous and energetic, and uh, we want to engage them, walk with them in coming years.